finally in person. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, it's wonderful. What flows in the veins of the world's oldest living civilization? Welcome to a special edition of Global Thinkers with me, Lu Xin, jointly brought to you by CGTN, Renmin University of China, and the city of Nanping in southern China's Fujian province. Today, we are in the picturesque Mount Wuyi, a special place in the formation of Chinese civilization. Here, the 12th century scholar Zhu Xi spent 50 years and developed new Confucianism. He also became known as a sage second only to Confucius. His ideas not only soaked through the Chinese, but also traveled to other parts of Asia. So while China stresses a Chinese approach to modernization, it's perhaps necessary to find out more about this ancient figure and his ideas. Exactly who is Zhu Xi? How have his ideas shaped the Chinese? And what does it mean to you? To explore these answers, I'm pleased to be joined by four distinguished guests. They are Professor Yang Huiling, Professor at the School of Liberal Arts of Renmin University of China, formerly a Vice President of the University. Tamara Prozik, Research Fellow at the School of Philosophy of Monash University in Australia. Professor Javier Garcia, a senior international journalist before, but now a professor at the School of Journalism and Communication at Remy University in China. And last but not least, Professor Roland Boer at the School of Philosophy of Remy University of China. We also have teachers and students from Uyi University, a leading institution in research into new Confucianism. The warmest welcome to all of our special guests and to all of our audience members. Thank you very much. So, um, my dear guests, we just had a sip of tea or two of uh, the famous black tea here in Uyi Mountain, which is a UNESCO cultural uh, heritage site, one of the very famous spots here in China. What is your impression of sipping tea here in Uyi? Professor Young, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, of course, the Uyi is quite famous for the high quality of Chinese tea. And uh, even Zhu Xi himself mm -hmm. uh, could be taken as an expert in tasting tea. He even used tea as an analogy to express some of his thoughts. So it's very philosophical to sip tea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, for instance, like he, uh, he said, uh, sugar is sweet. But anyway, too much sugar will let you taste uh, a little bit sour. Mm. But uh, 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 tea is a little bit bitter, but after a while, you will know what does the sweet means. Yeah, wow. uh, that, that, that is what uh, uh, expressed in one of the Juchi's books. Mm. Tamara, if you don't mind, I'm calling you Tamara. Um, was it the, is it the first time you're here in Mount Ui? And uh, yes. how is the experience yes. so far? How would you describe it? Well, it's a... You know, th this is my first experience of these strange Chinese mountains, which strange. are, <laughs> well, strange from my perspective. I grew up in a country where all the mountains are, have these very sharp peaks. Here, they're rounded. Yeah. And the second thing that really strikes me, I was in uh, Weishan, where we are, you know, uh, in, the, in the hotel down in the town, and I was in a shop trying to buy something. Of course, I don't speak Chinese, so I had a bit of trouble explaining what I want. Um, I was really surprised by how people jumped in to help me spontaneously without any, you know, there was a, one woman, then another one who knew English, so she spent about half an hour willingly helping me. So that's my first impression mm -hmm. about we, or at least the region, but I think that's the case for whole China, that people are very spontaneous and very hospitable. Mm. So that's my impression of. Yeah. Professor Garcia, your first time in Uyi as well? Do you have similar? Yes, impression? my first time in Uyi. I was already in other parts of Fuyang province, but not in the mountains, and it's really amazing here. I didn't have so much time uh, yet to know 
uh, very well in deep the region, but uh, the, the landscape is really uh, amazing. The steep slopes and the flat tops, these kind of mountains, a little bit karstic that I know from other parts in right. China, like Wheeling, uh, are really incredible for me. And yeah, now the green of the spring, and so one can feel here the biodiversity really in this region. Mm. It's a lot of tea, but not so much coffee. Are you craving? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like very much tea and the, the tea here is wonderful, but coffee, I need it in the morning overall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Professor Boa, are you, are you craving for coffee too? Or? Uh, well, actually, no, because I brought some Yunnan coffee with me and I grind the beans in the morning. Very smart. And, and have my coffee first thing, so I don't need any coffee now. Um, with tea, uh, and call me Roland by the way, that's fine. Um, with tea, the, the thing that comes up for me is conversation. It's when, and especially with the, the uh, Chinese style of having tea, with the, the, someone there with the leaves in a, a sort of major, a bigger pot and then the small cups, porcelain cups, you feel like sipping and talking and slowing down and taking time to discuss things. And that's the association, conversation. Yes. Conversation is what comes with tea drinking and that, that's what happened this morning. Yes. Um, so that's for me the, the impression, the experience. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so let's imagine that we are having tea here, <laughs> although uh, we don't uh, physically have it, but it, it is like, you know, chat over tea and talk about this place and the person that made it so famous and so important for the Chinese culture. This is a very beautiful setting and it's actually the first time that we produce a show from such a setting. It's, it's touching. I don't know how you feel about it. It touches me. Yeah. You know, the the structure of it and we are surrounded by history, by culture and by ideas which are very profound. Um, so we talked about this person Zhu Xi, um, Professor Yang, you are an expert in um, Chinese um, culture and ideas. So how important is this person? Because we all heard about Confucius mm -hmm. and there's this portrait of Confucius right behind yeah. us, which is yeah. world famous. But yeah. how important is Scarlet Jew? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah actually, as, just as what you mentioned just now, of the new Confucianism after in and after Song Dynasty, about uh, uh, 11 and 12 centuries, uh, even earlier than the English word tea could be used in, in, in the West, actually. Okay. Uh, in accordance with the Webster English Dictionary. How about this place? How about yeah. Mr. Zhu? Yeah, and uh, traditionally, I think uh, uh, Chinese intellectuals will follow Confucius as uh, the main, most important master right. of Confucianist tra tradition. But uh, after, in and after Song Dynasty, Zhu Xi could be another uh, representative of the new Confucianism. I think uh, briefly, uh, 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 traditional Confucianism uh, might be a little bit uh, lacking in uh, metaphysics, but after that, uh, everything has been changed, mm. together with the different resources like uh, the Buddhism and uh, uh, Taoism and the Book of Changes and other, other things. That is the main elements of new Confucianism, I think. So Zhu Xi gave it depth, gave it how would you describe it? If you're going to use three key words yeah. that the layman use. Yes, yes, yeah, it's quite challenging. N uh, no yeah, such yeah. words as metaphysics. I will be the first one who gets lost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, I could try to make it uh, as brief as possible. Three yeah. key words, okay. Uh, the first uh, phrase, if you like to mention about the key terms in New Confucian, must be li yi fen shu. That means uh, there's uh, one... In English, please. In the, yeah, there's <laughs> one, just a one words. principle yeah. out of the many appearances. Uh, or briefly, just like uh, what you could find in the uh, US dollars, ten, in 10, mm. there's a, 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 a proverb in Ladin. Uh, that, uh, there is the one out of the many. I think uh, that could be used as a one... Say it again, the, say it again, I didn't get it. There is, <laughs> there is the one out of the many. There is one. There out is of the one out of the many. Out of the many. Yeah, in Jewish words, that means uh, you could finally uh, find the, the single one, 
as a, a basic principle out of the many uh, uh, appearances. All right. Uh, he uh, make the moon like uh, a case, a special case. Yeah, please. He said uh, the, the moon reflects in the lake, lakes and the rivers everywhere. Mm -hmm. But even, anyway, all the reflections came from one moon. Mm. So, so that is in Chinese, Yue Yin Wan Chuan. Yeah. That's very <laughs> picturesque, poetic, yeah. <laughs> and philosophical. But uh, mm. how does it apply to yeah. you know everyday life mm. to our to our personality? Yeah. Um, Roland, I'm going to throw this question to you <laughs> <laughs> because you speak very good Chinese. You you study Chinese culture for a long time. But um, what is your understanding of such? Um, in every, in different forms, the, the, the one. I don't know how to even to summarize that. What you find with Zhu Xi is that it's a, a comprehensive system of thought. That's what, what Zhu Xi is able to provide in developing, drawing on the earlier strands, but developing a full system of thought. And I'm quite struck by the, the core category, or the one, if you like, of reason of reason, I called it heavenly reason, but reason. This is really, really important later on. We can talk more about it later. So system of thought and the importance of reason. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that may be something I'm not an, an, expert, an expert at all, far away from these two eminence. But what I know a little bit from, from Tuzi, um, he focused more on how things interacted with each other. When you compare with Tomas de Aquino, Aquino is in English, Tomas de Aquino Italian, who was contemporary to Chusi, he focused on the substance, how things are, and tried to explain with theories how things were. And Chusi was more how things interacted with each other. The experience was much more important for him, the experience. And this difference is key, I think, to understand the difference between Chinese thought and Western thought. Because Western thought was based on theories on speculations, on abstractions, mm. and Chinese thought was based on experience, on practical things, how things were useful for the people, for the reality. Mm. That is the main difference, I think. Well, if I can and follow on from that, okay, I mentioned the, the question of reason, but why reason? It was actually often seen as a type, or early type of political philosophy. Zhu Xi wanted to make practical contributions and proposals, and often quite critical of the, the Song court. Um, so all of this, what seems like abstract thinking, is actually very practical. What is better for the people? What is better to reform the system to improve the lives of people and so yeah. on? So it's that, that, that's behind it. And can I add, I mean, my, my, what I little know about him is that he kind of blended dialectics and inclusivity. So there is this inherent dialectical thought in him. So, and that probably comes from... from from looking at experience and how things develop because everything is in process, so nothing is stationary. And then he also had this thought about people being embedded in nature, so they were not, in Western thought, uh, there is this distinction between humans and nature. Humans are given dominion, as the Bible says, right, over nature. That's not the case in, uh, in China. And in my speech yesterday, I was actually making a comparison between you know, how, how Chinese gardens blend nature and human and culture seamlessly. You can't really, nothing is forced. The nature is not forced into human categories or cultural categories, while the human and the cultural also is not forced into natural, you know, organizations. So I think he, he kind of blended those things together mm -hmm. and that stayed with, with China. And I think today China is also like that. It is dialectical and inclusive, it includes the nature, includes others. So for the people who don't understand yeah. philosophy, yeah. dialectics, you know, it's a very... Two opposites, uh, <laughs> two different uh, sort of positions, two opposites, and then you explore the relationship between them. Yeah. Absolutely. And dialectics is a process of both and. It's yeah. an either or, but it becomes both and. Yeah. So they relate in complex ways with one another. So in this case, it's the relation, complex relations between human beings and our natural environment.
Yeah, absolutely. Professor Yao. Yeah. Holistic. Oh, sorry. Holistic. Yeah, right? I, had, I could just say. Uh, uh, Were they good? One thing, Were, yeah. Did they grasp uh, the essence? I, I, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think none of us are uh, really expert in the study of Zhu Xi. But anyway, in accordance with uh, another uh, past, uh, the scholar passed away many years ago, Feng Youlan, mm. he published a short book in English in the year of 1948. And he described the Zhu Xi as a, uh, the school of platonic idea in China, actually. That is Feng Youlan's <laughs> evaluation of, of, about Zhu Xi. And on the other hand, I think, uh, 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 in accordance with your question, uh, uh, dialectic, I think uh, <laughs> normally a Chinese philosopher would be taken as uh, the, 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 the expression of the logic of both ends. And in the West, the, the typical case is either or. Yes, that's correct. But anyway, yes. In Chi for Chinese, is both end. End for both the West end. is or. either or. or. Either or. or. Either or, is, or just both okay. ends. So, that, so, so am I am I correct to say? Sorry to interrupt. <coughs> that um, we have this Taoist tradition yeah. where things are constantly. <coughs> moving, developing, yeah. when yeah. you go to the other extreme, you actually yeah. come back to where you started. Is that how this, mm. how the Chinese mm. um, thoughts mm. is very much accommodative to the dialectic mm. tradition in yeah. the Western philosophy? The typical logic for the Western philosophy is uh, <laughs> identity. Uh, either or, and finally means mm. identity. Mm. But anyway, means. What yeah. dichotomy is? Yeah, both end, uh, both end means a completely different logic. That is the logic of correlation. Correlation. Okay. Everything uh, could be preconditioned mm -hmm. and uh, by another thing opposite to this. Is this unique for the Chinese? I mean, why would such an environment mm -hmm. 800 years ago mm -hmm. produce a school of thought that is uh, this in this particular shape? Uh, is there something special about Chinese? Mm -hmm. I don't know, genes <laughs> or our, mm. our society, our geography, the food that we eat, yeah. that make us see the world this way? Yeah, yeah. Very That's a very hard <laughs> question. <laughs> and you want one word answer, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> you want one word answer. I think one sentence is also okay. <laughs> oh, one, one sentence is okay. Um, to my mind, I, I put it in terms of yin yang. You think of the diagram of yin yang and the way it relates to one another. And my understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, that this originally comes from Taoism but then is incorporated within the whole of Chinese thought. That diagram embodies so much about the cultural assumptions, what we've been talking about, the dialectic, etc. So if I could explain it more, yeah. uh, that yin yang is, of course, is a uh, the, the basic uh, uh, archetype of Chinese philosophy, of Chinese dialectic. Th that means that nothing is ultimate, nothing is single. So from positive and negative to opposite things, we could find uh, something uh, mixed together. Uh, that is the ultimate uh, 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 authority in, mm. in, in Chinese philosophy. Mm. That is such tradition still very strong in Chinese culture, in Chinese identity? I mean, do, do, uh, is the modern day Chinese, the Chinese yeah. uh, political philosophy, our governance, is such a theory still very relevant? I, I would say yes. <laughs> very much still so. Still very much so. Mm. Very yes. much so. Yeah. It's in every Despite all the modern things, modern things exactly. we have. Exactly. It's a whole mindset, a cultural framework. It's in assumptions about food. Uh, in assumptions about what's appropriate for the seasons. Uh, it's just so striking and this for me is the big cultural shock. It's the way these things relate to one another and all aspects. Would you relate. give a more concrete uh, example or, or case when you talk about food or the seasons? How, you know, how striking? What were you stricken by for instance when you Fine. Well, give a personal example, when I went to see a, a doctor of uh, traditional Chinese medicine and I, I had some problems and uh, was assessed in the usual way with people are familiar, take my pulse, check my tongue, ask me questions and so on and so forth. And then the determination was that there was an imbalance of uh, a heat and cold in my body. I had too much heat and I needed um, you know, to restore that relationship and uh, I was given the medicines to take for a few weeks and it worked. 
but they, it dealt with the problem. Uh, but that's a very interesting, so still very much relevant? Very much part yeah. of the issue. Okay, Professor Garcia, you, you're interacting with young students, you teach in classes and you live in Beijing as well. What is your observation? Do you think what is embodied here in the Confucianism or New Confucianism or traditional Chinese, is it still very much relevant in the society we're seeing today? Yes, I think uh, Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism and even Taoism is uh, still very present in Chinese society and Chinese characteristics are so the characteristics of the people. And so it's really inside the people, no? not only in the politics and in the way of acting, but also in the, yeah, the, 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 the way of, of life and to think of the people. They have not this logic that we have, which, is, which comes from this dissection of the reality in, in, in boxes, you know? That is what the Western people does normally. The Chinese uh, think in unities, in images, it's different. They are not so rational, not so logic. More, uh, it's more a unity with the nature and also a unity of thinking. And so they don't have this kind of logic. And then for us, sometimes it's really difficult to understand how they react or answer us. I disagree with that. You disagree with him? I do disagree with that. <laughs> I, I think, I understand what you're saying, but uh, I think to say it's sort of logical reason uh, instead of images, I, I don't think is a correct no, distinction. Okay. Because, I mean, Zhu uh, Xi, uh, as we sort of talked about earlier, had a core, a core category of his thought was, in fact, reason. Reason, heavenly reason, as playing it's a role. It's a Chinese in it. logic. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. So but I would call it not logic. I don't know how you can call it. I agree. I agree, actually, with uh, with Javier. Sorry to say, uh, I don't. I think that the Western conception of reason is quite different to Chinese conception of yeah. reason. Yeah. Chinese conception of reason is more wholesome. It's more more uh, uh, unifying everything rather than separating into categories. And unfortunately, that comes from Plato, the initial, then the second offender was Aristotle, then you have, you know, taken up by the Western philosophy, Thomas Aquinas developed Aristotle to an end level, which was uh, uh -huh. not really <laughs> yeah. good for, for, for Western philosophy. And then you have more and more development into that categorization of things. Well, Chinese do understand that there are differences between things, but there are also similarities between them. Yeah. I don't live in China, I don't have experience of China, but what I know theoretically from what, for example, read about, uh, the last thing I read was uh, President Xi's speech about the Global Civilizations Initiative. You see that type of thinking included in that speech. There is a recognition that we are all different, different cultures, different civilizations, but we do belong to one, how would you say, family, right? We do belong to one unified family. So I think reason is very different in Western thought. No, even the language, when I say images, I, I was thinking in the language because your characters are images, right? Right. We, and this is, makes a different thinking because you think in characters, not in uh, words, ideas, logical ideas, like the West, there's also a difference that makes difficult the uh, communication sometimes, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> Roland, I, I, Roland is disagree. I disagree again. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. But it, is, <laughs> it is true the Chinese characters are like little pictures, little symbols, <laughs> some, some of them, not all, and, and uh, it developed. Why do you shake your head? <laughs> <laughs> well, I might ask my, uh, my colleague and mentor, Professor Young, to correct me uh, on this one, but my understanding from specialists in it is that the oldest characters that go back are ideographs, yeah. kind of stylized images, but 75% is actually phonetic. Mm -hmm. It's actually phonetic. Uh, and so there is, an, is a logic and a reason to it. And one of the attractions about uh, learning to read and write the characters is precisely to figure out the logic that's there and sometimes it's so logical. I think now, how, what, what would this word be? And then I find, I thought, well, of course, that's purely logical. It's not something different from but, what I was, what I was uh, doing, so. Well, but I, it's, I don't it's, it's not I'm a sorry. Western I, logic. I, 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 have a, I can leave the stage. I, 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 I have a, I have a favorite <laughs> character. <laughs> I, have, I don't know Chinese, but there is, I know a few characters, let's put it that way. There is one character 
Chinese character, my favorite. Mm. It's which one? Zhenzi. Which one? Zhenzi. Yeah. Benevolence. 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 Okay. That's okay. my favorite character. Mm -hmm. Why is it favorite character? Because it has the sign for men, for for human. Yeah. Yeah. Zhen. Right. I'm probably pronouncing it wrongly. You're pronouncing <laughs> it right. It's good. Yeah. But then there are those two lines next to it. Yeah. Right. So, it's benevolence is a relationship between two. Okay. Perfect. There is a goodwill that goes between two. So there is always two, right? There is always relation. Professor Yang, is this a Roman, romanticized yeah. <laughs> rendish yeah. interpretation? Because Ren is Ren? everywhere. Look, yeah. we have, yeah. we have yeah. the character right here. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know, we, yeah. should, we should show that character. This yeah. hall uh -huh. right, uh -huh. is called Ren Zhi Tang. It's very good you mentioned that word yeah. because mm. Ren is yeah. actually yeah. such an important yeah. word for yeah. the Chinese. Yeah. So yeah. it's confusing. Confucianism yeah. is all yeah. about Ren. Yeah. So what is Ren mm. and mm. why is it written mm. this way? Was it yeah. originally written this way? Yeah. yeah, actually that means the two persons. Yeah, basically, the two persons yeah. uh, uh, working together, that is Ren, benevolence. But another typical word is Shu. Shu uh, is a kernel thing because Which Shu, shu? Uh, shu? Uh, forgiveness, pardon. Ah, okay. Yeah, but anyway, in English translation, uh, one of the, the, the best uh, translation is not, uh, nothing to do with pardon or forgiveness, but uh, reciprocity. Reciprocity. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's about two people. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, community, not mm -hmm. only two, maybe many people. So Zhu uh, uh, Xi has a very good explanation about the reciprocity. Mm -hmm. That is Tui Ji Ji Ren. Yeah, that means uh, uh, the don't what do you, to don't others do, yeah, what you yeah, don't yeah, wish yourself. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that is a is principle. That, is that also yeah. embodied in the character Ren as of well? Course, of course. Because when yeah. you're dealing with each other, yeah. you are not yeah. supposed to impose. Yeah, yeah. linguistically, of okay. course. Okay. Yeah. But then, and uh, Shu, the, the interesting thing is that uh, Shu, uh, traditionally, originally, uh, the two parts uh, just to make uh, to uh, remind you of Ru the, the pronunciation and Ru and Xin. Yeah. But uh, after that, after the translation, it could be uh, gradually explained as a comparison with Heart. you and others. Oh. You hard and, and other hard. That's, that's, that's fascinating. a new explanation. That's Very fascinating. Yeah. Let's pause it there for a moment. A lot of food for thought, and mm. we have come to the end of the first part yeah. of our discussion. Many thanks to my guests. They have been Professor Yang Huiling, former Vice President of Renmin University of China, Tamara Prozik, Research Fellow at the School of Philosophy of Monash University in Australia, mm. Javier Garcia, Professor at the School of Journalism and Communication of Renmin University of China, and Roland Boa, Professor at the School of Philosophy of Renmin University of China. And with that, we come to the end of part one of the special edition of uh, Global Thinkers coming to you from the beautiful uh, Mount Wuyi in southern China. Thank you very much and of course a big round of applause to our audience members from Wuyi University, a local institution specialized in studying new Confucianism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.